Lord, this morning we're so, so grateful to be together, so grateful to be in your presence with your people. And as we sing, Lord, these songs that are songs of surrender, songs where we lay ourselves down, we just truly, truly, Lord, ask that you would consume us. Lord, we're saying that our gold and silver, our gold and silver, we lay at your feet. The things that give us security, we lay at your feet. The things that give us value, the things that lead us into pleasure and luxury. Lord, the gold and silver of our lives that we sometimes think is so precious, so important, so necessary. We're saying, Lord, that we're laying it down. And so what we, what we desperately need is for you to come in and fill the void, for you to be the goodness in our heart, for you to be our refuge and security, for you to be the all-satisfying reality in our hearts. Lord, would you rip out the, the old idols? Would you rip out the flesh? Would you replace whatever is gold and silver to us? Would you replace it with yourself? And Lord, we, we bow now and, and just ask that as, you, as we open your word and as you speak to us, that you would invade our hearts, that you would lead us on the journey that, as we just said, leads us to the promised land, which is you. God, bring us to that place where you are the treasure. You are the one that has our eye, that has our heart. We want it, Lord. We want you. And we are also saying that we're weak, that we can't do this in our own strength. And so, Lord, please, please, by your mercy, come meet us this morning. Lead us into the abundant life with you. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Uh, as you're taking a seat, if our kiddos have been checked in this morning, y'all can head to uh, the lobby. And anybody else... I want to invite you to take your Bible out to Psalm uh, 124. If you're here this morning and you don't have a Bible here with you and you'd like to have one in front of you, we've got a rack of Bibles right there on the back and you probably would be helped uh, to have Psalm 124 in front of you this morning. Psalm 124 that we've heard read uh, already this morning. Uh, Psalm 124 is a psalm about help. And I think we know that in this world, uh, there is no shortage of help. There is no shortage of advice. That you and I, were the kind of people that we would just, we always love a shortcut. We always love something that would just give us a little, little leg up, something that will make our lives just a little bit easier, something that will just help us in just the, the slightest bit. And I know this, we all love to give help. You know, somebody tells you they have a little problem and we just love to jump in and fix and help and make, try to make their life better. There is no shortage of, of help in this world. But this psalm, Psalm 124, is here in the Bible, intended to draw us away from all those other things that we think our help is really in, and to draw us into a life where we, we finally admit, we finally come to the conviction that all the help we need is in the name of the Lord, that the true help, the fundamental, the ultimate help that we actually need is in God. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things around our house that I feel pretty confident doing, fixing, you know, over the years of marriage and, and kind of moving from place to place, you kind of, you kind of get used to doing certain things around the house and you feel, you feel good about it. But, but one area that I am not confident at all is in electricity. So a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, one sort of whole side of our house just goes dark, goes black. None of the outlets will work. Uh, none of the switches will work. And yes, I did go check the breaker box and it wasn't fixing the problem. And I know enough, I know enough about myself when it comes to electricity, to know that I needed to call for help. I needed someone to come in who actually knew, first of all, to, how to even begin to diagnose the problem, let alone fix the problem. And I'm, I, can, I can tell you today that after watching what this guy did, this expert who came to my house, after watching what he did, it would have taken me hours and hours and hours, and I probably would have ripped my whole house apart trying to do what he did in three minutes. Why? I don't know what I'm doing. He does. He's an expert. And we know this in life, that when we call out to help, when we reach out for a hand, we want to know that the hand we're reaching out to is reliable, that there's confidence, that they know what they're doing. 
And this psalm is, is trying to bring us on a journey to see that there's really only one person. There's only one being in the universe who's an expert, who understands life, who can fix our problems at the deepest level. The reason you and I need a psalm like this is because there is so much false confidence in the world. We are constantly enticed. We are constantly tempted to put our confidence in ourselves. And yet so often we are way in over our heads trying to solve problems that we will never be able to solve. But there's also a lot of false confidence around us. There's people who are saying they can help, saying they can fix our problems, saying they know how to solve the answers. And yet generations and generations and generations go by, and here we are, all still struggling, stuck, desperate. This psalm is inviting us to see there is a place where we can find help. There is a a ground that is unshakable, a foundation that is firm. There is one who can meet our need, and his name is the Lord. The Lord, the Lord. So this morning, we're going to take a bit of a journey. We're going to kind of go through a process through this psalm that lands at a particular place. The conviction we're trying to end at is that our help is in the name of the Lord, but there's a process that we have to go on to to actually believe that our confidence is in Him. And so this morning, uh, as we take this journey, the first step along the pathway is that we acknowledge our need. We acknowledge our need. Let's read verses 1 through 5 of the Psalm 124 again. Verses 1 through 5 say, If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when people rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. Then over us would have gone the raging waters. So what we're going to see uh, throughout the psalm is that it's a testimony. This is somebody telling us a story of a past tense story. This is something that's already happened. But for us to feel the gravity, to first feel the gravity of what God has done in this testimony, we also have to know the weight, the depth of our inability. And that's why when, when David says, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, twice, twice, he's placing the accent on this truth. That the only reason anyone experiences victory, the only one anyone in this life overcomes, the only reason we win the battle is if the Lord is on our side. We can't take credit. David is not telling a testimony about how strong he was, about how awesome he did, about how great he fought. When he begins to tell this testimony, he's saying, look, 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 there is somebody who put the team on his back. There is somebody who took over. There is somebody who, because he was on my side, and only because he was on my side can I proclaim today that I am victorious. Um, there's a guy named Tom Brady. You've probably heard of him. Um, he's arguably one of the best uh, football quarterbacks that's ever played in the NFL. Uh, Tom Brady won seven Super Bowl championships. He won six of them with the New England Patriots. And then he went on to the Buccaneers and won another Super Bowl with the Buccaneers, which is just outstanding. So I don't think it's a controversial thing to say that Tom Brady is probably one of the best quarterbacks, if not the best quarterback, to ever play the game. What is controversial, though, is that Bill Belichick, who was the coach of the Patriots, has kind of a a, a precarious story at this point. See, Tom Brady, this quarterback, leaves New England, and the Patriots just start going down, 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 down. And now, Bill Belichick's not even the coach of the Patriots anymore. And if you look at Bill Belichick's overall record for the seasons that Tom Brady wasn't his quarterback, he actually has a losing record. So the big question is, was Bill Belichick actually a good coach, or did he just have the best player on his team? Can he he only say, the only reason I was good, the only reason I won all those Super Bowls is because I had the best player on my team. When David looks at his life, here's what he's saying. He's saying, "I, I actually can't take any credit for what I've done. There is somebody that because he was on my side, because he was on my team, because he was with me, we won. If he hadn't been with me, We would have lost. We would be dead. We would have been overwhelmed by the enemy. But because I had the Lord on my side, I am victorious. Now, um, maybe you're you're tempted to think, okay, fair enough. This is a good story. You know, I'm glad God did this for David. But what does this have to do with my life? You know, how does this relate to me? One of the things I love about this psalm is that uh, between verses 1 and 2, when David repeats himself, he, he adds something. You know, normally in the Bible, repetition is there for emphasis, and it is is there in this case as well. 
But David adds something in the middle of his repetition. He says, if, the, if, the, if, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side. So here's what David's saying. He's saying, look, this is my story. This is my testimony. But it's not just my testimony. David's looking at all the people of God of all time, and he's saying, this is your story. That as we observe this testimony in Psalm 124, we're not watching someone else's life. We're not watching someone else's story play out. We're seeing a, a retelling of our own life of our own story, of a picture of what God has done for us. The point of Psalm 124 is that it's very clearly teaching us that our story, our testimony, is not one that brings us glory. When we tell our testimony, when we tell the story of our life, it's not, oh, look how great I did. It's not, oh, look how I leveled up over all the other people around me. Our story is not, look, how I figured out all the life hacks and I found out all the wisdom to life and I, I learned how to navigate everything. That's not the story for the Christian. But sometimes that's actually what it sounds like when we talk about our lives, right? We begin to talk about our lives and it, it kind of sounds like we brought something to the table. It kind of sounds like we've actually done something. It kind of sounds like we're maybe a little bit better than the other people around us or we figured out how to not fall into the same traps as everybody else. When we tell the story of our lives, we tend to put a little too much emphasis on what we did. And so over and over and over, what the Bible does, and what it especially does in a Psalm like 124, is it gets back up in our face and it says, no, 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 no. And it rips us back into our sense of neediness. The Bible is constantly asking us these questions that, that force us to acknowledge that our story is, if the Lord has not been on our side, we would be lost. We would be doomed. For example, the Bible asks a question like this, what do you have, what do you have that you did not receive? What's the implication? The implication is, all right, let's, let's paint a picture of our lives. Let's kind of scan the whole picture of our life. And, and then let's ask, what thing can I point to in my life that I didn't receive as a gift from God? You know, who is it, who is it that is in the kingdom of God today because of their own merits? You know, who of us can, can say, no, 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 I actually paid for my own sins. You know, I actually took on Satan and defeated him. I actually took on death and, and defeated death. Can, can any person truly boast in themselves before God? Can any one of us say that, no, 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 it wasn't the Lord on my side. You know, it was me. No, regularly the Bible is getting back up in our face and it's saying, look, 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 this is your story. This is your story. That if the Lord had not been on your side, you would be dead. You'd be lost you had no chance. Um, I think that uh, there's a real sense among Christians today in the United States that a shift is taking place where the church is losing power and darkness seems to be kind of overtaking light and we feel kind of helpless and, and like there's a little bit of a pity party, I think, going on you know, with, with Christians in the United States. And I think the temptation in these moments, when it feels like power is being drawn out and you feel like you're losing your sense of influence in the world, the temptation is to grasp for worldly power. The temptation is to grasp for worldly wisdom. The temptation is to think that maybe what the church needs in America is maybe more money. Maybe it's a, a government that aligns with it. Maybe what the church in America needs is better programs, you know, more attractive ministries that will draw people in. We're tempted to think that what matters fundamentally is what we bring to the table, what we have to offer, what we can accumulate in this world. But what the church in the United States needs is more weakness, more neediness, more dependence upon God, more of what Jesus called a blessing, which is to be poor in spirit. What does that mean? Jesus is saying, we get to the end of ourselves. We realize that we are broken. We realize that without the Lord, we have nothing. What is all of our money? What is all of our programs? 
What is a government that's aligning with religious principles? What is all of that if we don't have the Lord? And if we have the Lord, if we have the Lord, if He's on our side, then then who can be against us? What situation could we find ourselves in that that we wouldn't end up in victory? Uh, There's a little green book on the book wall in the lobby that I love titled Gospel by Ray Ortland. I would highly uh, encourage you to to, to, um, take a look at that book, little green book called Gospel. And in that green book, uh, the author Ray Ortland says this. He says, a gospel culture, so he's talking about like a healthy church, a church that really understands what it means to be a church, requires us not to bank on our own importance or virtues, but to forsake self-assurance and exult together in Christ alone. This is why cultivating a gospel culture requires a profound moment by moment what he calls unselfing by every one of us. And then here's, I think, the key for this morning. He says, It is no disaster for a church to suddenly find itself having to radically depend on Jesus. It is no disaster for a church to suddenly find itself having to depend radically on Jesus. I wonder if we believe that that's true. I wonder if we believe that if all the crutches that we are leaning on and all the things that we felt like have propped us up in the world, if all that just gets knocked out from underneath of us, that that's not actually a problem, that that's not actually a disaster, that that might actually be exactly what what we need because when everything else is knocked out from underneath, when all the crutches are pushed out from underneath of us and we're stripped away from what we can do, then we find out what the Lord can do. We see his power at work in this world. So this journey, this journey towards a conviction that our help is in the name of the Lord starts here. It starts with this, the acknowledgement that our help is not in us. That it's not in the confidence that we have in what we offer. If we're going to cancel out all of our other options, it's got to start with us. But that leads us to our second uh, step along the journey this morning. The second step is that we bless our God. We bless our God. Verse 6 says, Blessed be the Lord, who has not given us as prey to their teeth. Uh, To bless God, it's kind of a word, a phrase that we don't use a lot in, in, in everyday language. But to bless, to bless God is to set Him apart with highest reverence, with highest admiration in our hearts. You know, it's kind of similar to praising Him or worshiping Him, but it has a more specific idea that it's, it's exalting Him to the highest place in our hearts. It's putting Him in the category of favorite, of highest, of best, of the one that we cherish as most exalted. And what I love about uh, what David's doing here is he's showing us how do we get to the point where we want to bless God. How do we get to the place where we want to exalt him and put him in that category of highest, best, favorite? What David is doing is he's dragging us back through our own story. He's dragging us back through our own testimony. He's wanting us to worship our way back through the story of what God has done for us so that God would rise, that that, that our honor for him would just elevate up and up and up and up. Um, I'm not somebody that really likes to watch the same movies over and over and over again. I know that... um, I'm sure there's some of you that are like that. You're kind of weird like that. Like every weekend, you know, you like to watch the same movie. I'm like, I don't get it. But um, what, I, what I've loved is that as my, as my kids now are growing up, we've kind of had to go back and watch some of the same uh, movies that, we, that I watched as a kid. And we're, we're re-watching stuff that we watched as a kid. And it's kind of cool. It's like, even though I've seen some of these movies, like I feel like a hundred times, you re-watch it and it's like you're reminded again, wow, like this is a cool story. I remember as a kid why I love this. I remember why I watched that 500 times over and over and over again when I was a kid because it had something special about it. Well, what David's trying to do is he's trying to show us that throughout our Christian life, we have to go back and rewatch the story and rewatch the story and rewatch the story in order to keep not just the not the value of the story so much, but the value of the God of the story. 
that we would never lose sight of how valuable, how important, how revered and honored God should be for what He's done in our lives. So what in particular is this psalm drawing us to remember? How is it showing us what God has done for us? How is it revealing our testimony, our story? Well, we don't know exactly uh, what situation from David's life gave rise to this psalm, and that's kind of the point. That as David uh, pins Psalm 124, we don't know exactly what situation he's in, but here's what we do know. He's describing God's deliverance of him in the same terms as that of the Israelite exodus. That as David begins to tell, this, tell the story of our testimony, he frames it in, in the, through the lens of the Israelite exodus. See, when, the, when, when God brought Israel out of the exodus, they had Pharaoh and his army on one side, they had the, the raging waters of the sea on the other side, and they were stuck. They had no way out. There was nothing they could do. They were either going to die in the water or they were going to die at the hand of the enemy. What made the difference? One thing. The Lord was on their side. And so God did the impossible. He literally split the sea. They walk across on dry land and then they turn around and they watch Pharaoh and his armies plunge under the waters of death behind them. That is what gives rise in their hearts to a, a song of blessing. If you go back and read in Exodus chapter 15, they just burst just like David does here. Blessed be the Lord. That's exactly what Israel does as they see the waters plunge down upon their enemies. And so this, this story of the Exodus actually becomes kind of a, a pattern or a paradigm of salvation that we see God use over and over and over and over throughout the Bible. And I think that if we, if we just thought about it for a minute, we would think about why that makes a lot of sense. Uh, you and I, we, we don't like being stuck. We don't like feeling like we're in a place where we can't move forward and we can't break out of it. I, I bet that you wouldn't have to think very hard about the last time you felt stuck. And the reason why we... Uh, talk about our, the good things in our lives uh, in a weird way. Here's how we sometimes talk about the good things in our lives. We say that they are an escape. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about going on a vacation, what? To, a, to escape. What are we escaping? We're not leaving this world. We're just getting unstuck from the monotony of our life. Or for some of you, it's like, man, just, you just got to come home at the end of the day and you just need that little glass of wine and that two hours of a TV and you just, it's just a feeling of like, I just got to break out for a little bit. I just need an hour or an hour and a half. Just, I just got to step out of the, the, the difficulty of, of life today. Maybe it's an, a person that you've come to see as a sort of a release or an escape for you or, or pretty much just about anything that we do in our spare time. It, it can become this idea of, of an escape. And that's what makes this picture of the Exodus, such a powerful one, it taps into something that we all know far too well, and that it's that life sometimes presses us down. It, it makes us feel like we can't break out, and sometimes we just want to be drawn out. That's what the word Exodus means. We just want to be, we just want to break out. We just want to feel free. But I think maybe that sense that we all have that we're stuck and that we need to be broken out, that, that sense that we're in bondage and we need to be set free, it actually tells us something even deeper than we might realize. That it explains something about our collective experience as human beings. Uh, the Apostle Paul in, in Titus chapter 3, verse 3, he describes uh, our situation like this. Paul says, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves, Paul says, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. And then another uh, passage in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Again, Paul's describing, he's, he's, he's including himself. He's saying, this is me, this is you, this is all of us. He says, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. What these passages teaches is that every single one of us at one time were under the dominion of sin. We couldn't do 
anything else but sin. We couldn't ever in any way live a life pleasing to God. We were stuck. We were encaged. We were under the dominion of our rebellion against God. And what these uh, passages also teaches us is that every single one of us at one point, we're actually following the influence of Satan. We were disciples of Satan. We were being more and more and more living out his pattern instead of living more and more and more out the pattern of God in this world. And every single one of us, every single one of us was under the dominion of death. And not just the first death, but what the Bible calls the second death, where we, not, we don't just die at the, at the end of our life, but we actually go and stand before God and give an account for our life and are judged for our sins and then pay for our sin against God forever and ever and ever and ever. That is how we are born into this world. So maybe that deep desire we have to get unstuck, that deep desire we have to escape, it actually taps into something way more profound, that every single one of us is born into this world a slave to sin, following the power of Satan and knowing full well that no matter how hard we try to push it away and push it off, death is our shepherd. Death hangs over our heads. And so, that's what makes the gospel of Jesus Christ not just good news, but the good news of the ultimate exodus. See, Jesus, our Savior, willingly came from heaven to earth and went down into the bondage of our sin. And he willingly offered himself up into the hands of sinful men who we know, the Bible tells us, were under the influence of Satan. And then Jesus was plunged, he was baptized, he was dunked, he was suffocated, he was drowned under the waters of death. But then Jesus arose victorious, triumphing over sin, death, and Satan. Jesus accomplished the ultimate exodus, and he didn't just get a weekend escape. Jesus didn't just kind of break out for a little while. Jesus didn't get just some sort of earthly, temporary victory. Jesus broke out of this world altogether. Jesus broke out of the bondage of our death and went and sat down in the heavenly places. And so the Bible is teaching us, David is teaching us, this is our testimony. This is our story that if we've placed our faith in Jesus, we're not just getting a little escape. We're not just getting a little reprieve. We have actually broken death. We have broken the dominion of sin. We have broken the power of Satan in our lives because of what we've done. No, no, all because of what Jesus has done. And so we're just like the Israelites. Here they are. I mean, can you imagine Pharaoh and his armies on one side, the, the sea on the other side, knowing that you are totally stuck. There is nowhere to go. And then all of a sudden the waters part. You walk across on dry ground. You look back. The waters plunge down on Pharaoh and his armies. What else is there to do other than to bless the Lord? What else is there to do other than for God to rise higher and higher and higher as we celebrate that he has done what we could never do? What else is there to say other than Psalm 124, 6, Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. See, it's as God rises higher and higher and higher. Here's how this fits in the larger picture of what we're talking about this morning. As, as we get dragged back through our testimony and we worship our way back through what God has done for us, God rises in our hearts. And then the next time we need help, it becomes more instinctive to turn to him because he's worthy. We've seen his power. We've seen his grace. We've seen his love. We've seen him do for us what we could not do for ourselves. And with him up and with ourselves down and with the whole world around us down, what I mean by that is, uh, the admiration, the reverence, the fear, the awe that we have down and the awe and reverence of fear we have for God up, then it makes sense that we turn to him when we need help because it's our story. But really that leads to our third step on the journey this morning, which is that we celebrate our freedom. We celebrate our freedom. Verse 7, David continues. He says, we have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken. And we have escaped. 
What I love about how David continues here is, you know, he talks about how um, we've been set free from, from the enemy that wanted to swallow us. We've been set free from the waters. But then he, he comes to this point where he's saying, hey, look, it's not just that we've been set free. It's not just that we broke out of bondage. He's saying we broke out and we can't be put back. He's saying the cage, the snare that was out for us, the weapon that was formed against us, it's been broken. It's been snapped. It can't come after us anymore. Once we've been brought out from under the dominion of sin, we can't be put back again. Once we've been brought out of the power of Satan, we can't somehow make some mistake or or fall off the ledge or have a bad day and be put back into the kingdom of darkness again. Once we have risen with Christ by faith through him in our baptism, when we were plunged down into the waters with him and then we were raised up out of the waters with him like we saw last week, once we've been raised with him, death has no claim over us anymore. Um, I, 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 a few years ago, I really got into this show called Prison Break. Um, if you haven't seen it, it's pretty much what it sounds like. It's a show about people who break out of prison. And uh, it, it's, it's great. I, I, you know, I don't know. I think I can recommend it. Anyway, uh, pr- Prison Break. What I noticed after kind of watching that show and kind of living, living you probably shouldn't watch it. Okay. Um, <laughs> after going through a few seasons of that, that show, what I realized is that that actually happens in real life. Like, it's kind of wild to think about that. That, uh, you know, every so often, I don't know how often it is, but every so often somebody breaks out. And, you know, you think about what that experience would be like. Like maybe for a moment there would be this sense of like achievement and relief. But you have to believe that breaking out of prison is not true freedom. It's not real freedom. Why? Because at any moment you could be taken back. At any moment, you could be turn around, tur- turn your turn around your shoulder, and there's somebody there who has found you out, who has caught you, has who is ready to take you back into the place that you that you thought you would escape from. And what David is saying here is he's saying that is not the experience of the Christian. When Jesus broke death, it was done forever. When Jesus broke out of the power of Satan, when Jesus broke through the dominion of sin, he broke the snare. There's no prison for us to go back to. We're not living this Christian life, looking over our shoulder, wondering, am I going to mess up today? Is God going to stop loving me? Am I going to somehow fall out of his grace? No. We have been set free. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Uh, Here's how Paul describes this in Romans chapter 6, verses 6 through 9. He's the apostle celebrating our freedom. He says, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. It's past tense. Paul's saying if you're you're in Jesus, if you put your faith in him, you have been crucified. It's past tense. It happened already. Verse 7, for one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know, listen to this, Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. When Jesus rose from the dead, he broke the power of death. When Jesus triumphed over Satan, he broke the power of Satan. When Jesus triumphed over sin, he broke the dominion of sin in our life. We're free and we're not going back. So here's the deal. I think what can happen is when we aren't rejoicing and celebrating in the freedom that we have in Christ, as as we've been pounding in our heads over the last eight weeks or so, that we are more than conquerors. When we aren't reveling and celebrating in what Jesus has done for us to set us free, that's when we become susceptible to reach out for help to the wrong things. Um, You know, our our health gets a little hairy. Our finances kind of get out of whack. Something comes into our life that was unexpected. And instead of remembering that death is broken, that I'm safe with God, that there is a maker of heaven and earth who is on my side, we end up reaching out for some sort of worldly power. We end up reaching out for some false savior who we think might fix this broken world. You know, what can happen is is we kind of turn into those same Exodus Israelites. If you know the story, you know what happened. After Israel experienced this amazing salvation where God brought them out of Egypt, 
they, they, they threw the party, they blessed the Lord, they, they, they sang the song, and then about five minutes later, they started complaining. You know, would it actually be that God would have rained down the plagues upon Egypt, that he would have uh, given them the Passover lamb, that he would have split the Red Sea so they could walk through, that he would have crushed Pharaoh and his armies uh, down into the waters behind them only to let them starve in the wilderness? Would God have actually done that? And yet sometimes I think that's how we live. We, we forget that the God who's on our side at all times, in all places, is the same God who raised Jesus from the dead, the same God who reached into our hearts and transformed us, who broke the dominion of sin in us. We forget that it's the same God, the God of this testimony, the same testimony that David had, that Israel had, that Jesus had, that that same God, moment by moment, is at our side. So when we're celebrating the freedom we have in Christ, when we're rejoicing in the fact that we are more than conquerors, here's what it does. It puts our every single present circumstance in perspective. It writes a banner over anything we're going, in our, going through in our life, that there is ultimate victory in Jesus. That is the banner that hangs over whatever situation you and I find ourselves in. To celebrate our freedom in Christ, it, it frames, it reframes everything we're going through. So now, rather than grabbing for false saviors, grabbing for false idols, grabbing for false help, instead, we move through the trial, the struggle, the difficulty, believing, believing that we are more than conquerors. And our journey really leads to this final step. It kind of culminates in verse 8. So why has David been dragging us through our testimony? Why is he trying to stir up in us the wonders of what God has done for his people Finally, this morning, our final stop is that we establish our help. We establish our help. Verse 8 brings this psalm to a close, saying, Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Uh, The whole point of this psalm, the whole point of this testimony, the whole reason that you and I need to retrace our steps again and again and again is so that we would finally form this conviction that our hope, our help, our assistance is not found anywhere else but in one name. You know, sometimes, sometimes what we all need to do is to go back and really think through our story again. To remember what it was like before the Lord intervened in our life to remember again how we were in bondage, how destructive our life was, how we treated other people in such gross and selfish ways, to remember how we were stuck in the passions of the flesh, to remember how the values that we cared about, the the, the vision that we had for life, what we thought was important, it was all empty to remember that God reached down into our darkness, into our death. And maybe you're here this morning and and you feel like that's not your story. You don't have that testimony. Maybe you came to the Lord at a young age and you you feel like, yeah, you've had sin in your life and you know you've wandered at times, but you don't don't feel like you had this long period of of dominion under sin and that sort of thing. Well, what, what you do is you look at this and you say, man, this is what I would have been. This is what I would have become. This is the path that I would have traced if it hadn't been for the Lord. If it hadn't been for His stepping in and rescuing me. We all know enough about the deception of sin and the the, the power of sin. We all know enough about it to know that even if it hasn't dominated our life for a long period of time, we can know just how destructive life would have been if we had kept on the course that we were going. And so we go back and we relive it and we remember, we rewatch the movie and we slowly but surely come to form the conviction that help is in one name. Now maybe that idea of help being in a name is kind of weird. You know, you kind of get to the end in verse 8 and you, you, you kind of expect it to say our help is in God. Our help is in Him. 
but it says that our help is in the name of the Lord. You know, what's with that? I mean, I think that we understand it, right? I mean, we all put trust in certain names, right? You, you know, your clothes wear out or you need to head, to head out shopping to the mall. You, you have a place, you have a name, you have a brand, you have somewhere that you trust, something you're going to. Your car breaks down, you have a name. I can tell you this, if any of you have electricity problems in the next few weeks, I have a name for you. I have a name and I have a testimony with that name. That I, my house was broken. I, had, I, had, I was in trouble. I, had, I was outmatched. I couldn't figure it out. I called a name. The name showed up. And that name is reliable. That name can be trusted. And what David is saying is he's saying once we get clear on our testimony, once we get clear on just how needy we were, just how amazing the salvation was, and, and as God's, uh, the blessing of God rises and we see him as more, revealed, more revered and more honored, we, we slowly but surely come to say there's a name. There's a name and I, I know the story. I was broken, I was dead, I was lost. If it had not been for the Lord, there is a name. Psalm 27 and 8 puts it this way. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. Some trust in chariots and horses, and they collapse and fall. Some put their trust in what this this world has to offer, and it won't last. But we, we put our trust in the name of the Lord, and we rise. Um, When it comes to the help that we need, as we kind of wrap up this morning, I want to try to think practically about this, because there's different ways in which we uh, try to find help in this world. So I want to try to think through this. I want to talk about sometimes how help comes uh, in a direct way, sometimes it comes in an indirect way, and then sometimes it comes from what I would call uh, things that are out of bounds. Direct, indirect, and out of bounds. Let's talk through this. Let's start with out of bounds. Sometimes you and I We get in those moments where we feel stuck, we feel the squeeze, we feel like we need an escape, and what we reach to for help is something that's out of bounds, something that's sinful. Maybe we reach towards lying, maybe we reach towards cheating, maybe we, we reach towards drunkenness, gluttony, sexual immorality. We look for help in things that are so clearly sinful, so clearly out of bounds, and I just want to say to you this morning, if that's you, if, if, if you hear this and you think, yeah, I'm looking for help in things that are sinful, that are out of bounds. I just want to invite you, come into the light. The Lord Jesus is, is ready with open arms to receive you. We are ready with open arms to receive you. The sin that you think you're finding help in, it is only leading you to destruction. Sin never, ever, ever leads anywhere but to destruction. So come into the light, repent, and we'll rejoice. Um, But let me me talk about um, direct help. What do I mean by that? I mean, sometimes the help we need has to come directly from God, like a direct, immediate intervention of His Holy Spirit. You know, like when somebody crosses over from death to life, when someone who's lost is found, when someone who's not a Christian becomes a Christian, that is a direct, immediate effect of the Holy Spirit working in someone's life. Um, when, 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 at, when at the end of the world, heaven comes to earth and God's peace invades this world, that, that's something that none of us can do. There's no, there's no middle ground, no means. God's not using anything else. It's Him. It's His direct presence. And there's, there's other things like this. But what we're tempted to do sometimes is to, to think that we can do the things that only God can do. To think that we can do the things that, that he only can directly affect himself. And so in those moments, what do we do? Well, the only thing we can do in those moments is to fall on our knees and pray. There's, there's nothing else. There's no impact. There's no way we can fix it. There's no way we can add to the equation. Simply, 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 all we can do is pray. Lord, in your mercy, give the direct help that's, that's only what you can do. But, but this other one, uh, what I call indirect help, I, th- I think is the most difficult. Not necessarily, not necessarily the one that trips us up the most. I think we get tripped up uh, plenty of times by the out-of-bounds and, and, and by inserting ourselves and trying to do what only God can do. But what I mean is, 
I think this is the one that's the hardest for us to understand. Because sometimes the help that you and I get in our lives, even help that's from God, it comes to us through specific means. So like every, every single day, or hopefully every single day, we're eating food, right? We're eating food, and that food is keeping us alive. Or, or, or you know, we do, uh, you know, in November, we're going to go in and we're going to press a button on the voting ballot, and it's, it's going to affect things in our world. You know, there, there's things about our life where we get this help from, it can be from God, but it comes to him indirectly. It comes to him through means, and sometimes I think we struggle to know how to do this. So, you know, the, the psalm is saying that our help is in no other name, and yet I'm going to go eat lunch, Right? I'm, I'm going to surround myself with friends and family. I'm going to have some things in my life that do give me assistance. And so how do I engage in this world? How do I live in this world and not turn those things into idols, turn those things into gods? How do I receive the help that comes through means without turning the means into my God? Well, I don't have a perfect definition for you, but I, I just want to give you some examples. Try to show you what this might look like. So one example is it might look like going into the voting booth and saying, Lord, you are my joy. You are my hope. You are my contentment. I'm pressing this button because I do believe it's my responsibility to press it. But ultimately, Lord, ultimately my help is not in any of the names on this ballot my help is in one name. My help is in you. Pressing the button, walking out, and saying, Lord, your will be done. I'm going to praise you tomorrow, no matter what. My heart is in your name, not in, not in these names. That's just kind of an example of what that might look like. Another example would be this. I'm on my way to the doctor's office, and I say, Lord... <laughs> I know, I'm, I know, Lord, I know that you have promised that you're going to heal me. It might be in this life, or it might be when I get my resurrection body that Jesus has purchased for me, but I know, I know, Lord, that you are the great physician and that you are going to heal me. And Lord, I'm going to this doctor because it's the best that I know how to do, and, and Lord, I would love if you would heal me. I would love if you would help me through this person but ultimately, Lord, my help is not in the name of this doctor. It's not in their title. It's not in their credentials. It's not in their education. My ultimate hope, Lord, is in your name. And it might even look like, you know, something as simple as this. It might look like in our everyday relationships that we have, you know, whether it's moms in the room or maybe you're a widow or maybe you are someone who's single or maybe, maybe you just know how sweet it is to have people around you, to have encouragers around you, to have fellowship around you. But every day we wake up and we say, Lord, out of all the people in my life that are important to me, that I love, Lord, there's only one. There's only one that I can't live without. And it's you. Lord, if every, everybody else who I care about and everybody else who encourages me gets pulled away, is stripped out of my life, Lord, it would be really, really hard. But God, you are what satisfies me. You are the one who holds me up. You are the one that I desire. And to, 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 to pray that in faith, say, I'm not afraid. I'm not, not interested in you bringing people into my life. But at the end of the day, my help is not in any name. It's not in any person. It's not in my kids. It's not in my spouse. It's not in my friend. It's in the Lord. I think you, you kind of see where this is going. I don't have a perfect definition. I don't have a perfect explanation. But I think it's this. I think that it's as we trace this journey again and again and again where we acknowledge how needy we are, we see the great and awesome salvation of the Lord, and as He is blessed in our hearts, which means he rises higher and higher and higher and higher. Then when we get in those moments, when we're tempted to put our trust in the wrong things, to put our hope in the wrong things, to put our help in the wrong things, we'll say, no, no, my help, my help is in the name of the Lord. Uh, this morning, as we kind of finish up, I'll, I want to invite everyone to stand up. And what I would love for us to do is I would love for us to read this psalm aloud together. Um, our worship team's going to come, and they're going to lead us in a song after this. But this is our story. This is our testimony. 
And so I want us all to uh, say Psalm 124 out loud together. Psalm 124. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when people rose up against us, they would have swallowed us up alive. When their anger was kindled against us, then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. Then over us would have gone the raging waters. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Let's sing together.